Well, hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today. It is the top of the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. To all of you, our many guests across a number of time zones, good afternoon. My name is Emily Eberly, and I will be your moderator today. I want to thank you for joining us for our Improved Monitoring, Improved Outcomes webinar series. The title of today's webinar is Capnography. Isn't it time to recognize it as the fifth vital sign? Speaking on this very important and timely topic is Dr. Ruben Restrepo. Dr. Restrepo is professor and director of the bachelor's degree completion program in the Department of Respiratory Care at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio, Texas. Trained in medicine in Medellin, Colombia, Dr. Restrepo has achieved academic positions at Georgia State University and then at the University of Texas. He has published widely in the field of respiratory care, including book chapters and articles, and has given many presentations. He is a reviewer for several major journals in respiratory and pulmonary medicine and is the recipient of many honors and awards for his teaching, publications, and volunteer work. Doctor does disclose that he is on the Medical Advisory Board and is a speaker for Teleflex Medical. He is an investigator and speaker for Iridian Capnography. He is on the Advisory Board for Salter Labs. And he is an investigator and speaker for Fisher & Paykel, as well as an investigator for Hillrom. Dr. Restrepo, it has been a real pleasure working with you as we prepared for this event. Are you ready to begin your presentation? Absolutely. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the audience that is uh, keeps growing as uh, every minute. So wh what I wanted to accomplish today is summarizing these learning objectives to describe the clinical criteria used to define respiratory depression and what we know, what we take uh, typically into account to monitor um, the uh, procedural sedation or all of those procedures that are associated with uh, induced respiratory depression, mainly in tidal CO2 and pulse oximetry. So uh, let me just go ahead and start with a case report. Uh, this is a 71-year-old uh, female who underwent uh, total hysterectomy for uterine prolapse. Uh, the important thing that I, I wanted to highlight is that the patient didn't have any past medical history that was remarkable or something that we could see as a red flag for any type of respiratory issues which may be the case in many situations. The pre-op lab tests were considered within normal limits. The patient went under general anesthesia for the procedure, uh, roughly about 150 minutes with just uh, minimal blood loss. Uh, the patient got some Harman, some IV fluids. The patient was then uh, transferred to the uh, uh, pediatric uh, to recovery unit. And uh, the patient was started on the IV uh, PCA with uh, 1,000 micrograms of fentanyl, some ketorolac, some on Dancitron. As you can see, the blood pressure, heart rate, and SpO2 were relatively stable. Unfortunately, what happened after just a, a little bit of time and the PACU is that the patient started dropping saturations to 80%, became unresponsive, hypotensive, bradypneic, and the patient had to be intubated and sedated for uh, roughly about 10 minutes. Uh, fortunately for the patient, again, without any prior history of respiratory disease, the patient had a, a full recovery in about 20 minutes. The patient was extubated and, of course, uh, discharged one week later. So the, the, first, the first question that I have, if we can ask, if we can ask Emily to just, uh, uh, again, have some interaction with you is, uh, do you typically monitor patients uh, again, in regards to CO2 even when they don't have any risk factors? So our audience is voting. And I'll give it three more seconds or so. And then, Doctor, would you like me to close the poll and share the results? Yes, please. Okay, sure. All right, a majority of our audience has voted. Thank you, folks. I'm going to go ahead and close that now. And we're going to share the results. And, Doctor, what do you make of that? Actually, very interesting. And I'm so glad to hear that the majority of you, about 63%, would say yes, even if you have patients without any uh, risk factors for uh, respiratory depression. So if we can go back to the presentation, Emily. Okay, so what I'm going to use as the outline will be to define, of course, normal breathing, which everybody probably just knows, and uh, what is the basic definition of respiratory depression. 
and uh, you can see exactly what I meant to cover, the procedural sedation, epidemiology, just trying to concentrate on the impact of respiratory depression, trying to determine exactly what is the current status of monitoring, how do we monitor these patients today, uh, the use of supplemental oxygen and how this may impact what we know about respiratory depression. Uh, if capnography has made any difference in the incidence of respiratory depression, I'm finally hoping to come up with some uh, summaries, uh, summary and recommendations. So let me go start from the beginning. I think we all know that um, the normal breathing pattern is typically the one where the chest and the abdomen moves in average depth, and of course there is no use of accessory muscles. Uh, the patient has uh, breathes comfortably, so you don't have to have any, again, uh, diaphoresis or any sweating associated with this or any retractions. And of course, normal, normal breathing will be always associated with uh, clear uh, breath sounds. On the other hand, uh, respiratory depression is typically when you have slow uh, respiratory rate, very shallow breathing. Uh, and again, you can argue, uh, well, how do you determine this? And there may be, again, more sophisticated ways in the future exactly to determine how, how it is going to be that you as a clinician determine uh, tidal volume or minute ventilation. But in the meantime, again, just observation of the patient will be just poorly enough. The patient is unarousable or difficult to arouse, as you see in the enrichment scale. It's, uh, again, a patient that is typically, again, difficult to just wake up. What we typically do when we have PCA on board uh, and you have a respiratory depression, in this particular case, opioid induced rep respiratory depression, would be of course to stop the PCA or so any, any narcotics will be stopped. Uh, of course, you have to maintain the IV and notify the ND. And in many instances, maybe just to consider a reversal agent such as uh, Narcan or Naloxone. But typically, of course, you're going to try to apply oxygen PRN but the most important thing would be to maintain the airway patent. So what is this thing of procedural sedation and analgesia? So the uh, Society of Anesthesia, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, the ASA, has defined this as a drug-induced depression of consciousness during which patients respond purposefully, purposefully to verbal commands, either alone or accompanied by light tactile stimulation. No interventions, which is probably the key here, are required to maintain a patent airway. Spontaneous ventilation is adequate, and cardiovascular function is usually maintained. So that means that if we are doing the right thing, no intervention should be required in the majority of patients. However, the reality that I'm going to try to present to you to convince you that uh, we may not see the amount of respiratory depression that we typically suspect to see, but it's actually higher. I think it is reality, and many of you have probably gone through the uh, procedure like interventional radiology, pain management, cardiac cath, electrophysiology. So the reality is that many of these procedures are growing in number, and these are taking place outside the emergency, the operating room. So that means that in many cases, up to 40% of these procedures are performed or supervised by non-anesthesiologists. However, uh, typically, if you go back a few decades ago, none of these procedures were typically done unless um, the anesthesiologist was present because heavy sedation or heavy analgesia has, be, has been associated with some degree of anesthesia. So I think we can assume that any time you go through a procedural sedation, you have some moderate sedation, routinely administered in variety of clinical settings, as I mentioned, for all age groups. But there's no question that if you look at before and after monitoring, the incidence of complications and what is more importantly, mortality has dramatically decreased. Uh, as respiratory therapists, we, I think we concentrate on the fact that if we are able to determine degree of hypoxemia secondary, secondary to respiratory depression, we realize that of course by treating this, we may prevent some death. However, the, uh, what we have learned in school from, for the longest time is of course that Pulse oximetry doesn't give you any sense of uh, hypoventilation, and it is typically late when you have hypoxemia that is the end result of hypoventilation. By the same token, as much as we want to assess the patient, just relying on visual assessment may not be, again, telling us the whole story behind hypoventilation on these patients. So I, I think it's very key to realize that many patients may be at risk for respiratory depression. 
uh, those patients who have been categorized with the category of three, three to five when you're, when you're using the, again, the American uh, Society of Anesthesia, those patients who are a little bit older with a high BMI, patients who have history of sleep apnea, uh, patients who, again, require standard monitoring, or again, depends on the total dose of the sedative on analgesic. Of course, it makes sense to think that those patients who have higher doses of sedatives and analgesics are going to be at risk for developing respiratory depression at one point. I think uh, something that I, I, I still remember from any type of presentation about something that maybe I'm not familiar with is that, so who cares and why and what is the impact? So let me just cover some of the epidemiology of respiratory depression. Um, the Joint Commission, I think we are always scared about what the Joint Commission says, but it is only just looking at patient safety, is that uh, they find pain as the fifth vital sign, and I think pain is key, is key here because we are using opioids to, of course, uh, numb or to control the pain that some patients have, uh, typically, again, in the post-op period. So I think they call for assessment of pain in all patients to record results, to ensure staff competency and to educate patients and families about effective pain management, but also just to realize that you have to train relatives and patients who go home after being on a PCA or after being using, uh, um, being using narcotics, just to be cautious about the fact that if you are at risk. Mm -hmm. So the Institute of Medicine that in a sense dictates uh, how we're going to do things and we are going to do it right uh, to the premise of do not harm, uh, speaks of the patient safety programs that should incorporate safety principles. So as you can see through the diagram, and I'm going to go over every single one, when you have, again, a PCA or a pump, you have to assess the patient, of course, for pain, sedation, cognition, and, again, respiration. And you have to be able to document that, especially on those patients who are naive to opioids, that who, who who have never received a treatment with narcotics that may be, again, more susceptible to respiratory depression. I'm going to take advantage of, again, the work uh, that was summarized by the two very good friends, Greg Spratt and David Lane, uh, very recently, again, fall of 2013, by just trying to summarize some of the data that, to me, again, was a little bit scary and sometimes surprising. And it is the fact I can let you read through, but you can see that patient safety events uh, just come uh, very often in the slide, and also just the fact that it's a very expensive proposition, that it could cost a lot of money if we are not, again, uh, knowledgeable enough to prevent some of these issues. Uh, specifically speaking, if you see the post-op respiratory failure and pressure ulcers could be up to 54% of the complications of these patients. And that means also, as you see in the last, the last line of the slide, one preventable Medicare death every 20 minutes for just these 13 event types. So again, I wanted to highlight this too, is that if you look at post-op respiratory failure, you see the incidence is actually higher than what you have for sepsis. So I, I think, again, my invitation is to consider that this is a, a very common phenomenon but again, we may not be aware only because sometimes we don't have the tools to determine exactly what's going on. I think all of us have heard of the Sentinel event alert. So in this particular case for the opioid-induced respiratory depression, the Joint Commission actually just mentioned that one on every three, uh, one out of 83 um, Sentinel event alerts were related to improper monitoring. So that means that we are not able to capture probably all the events that typically happen. But again, don't blame it on the uh, clinician. Uh, we have had issues with medical devices, as you can probably are familiar with. Uh, sometimes you have to, again, disconnect the patient and change the ventilator. You have sometimes to change the tube because the cough leaks or uh, just simply ruptures. So, so it happens also with PCA pumps. And that's why, that's why again, a combination of monitoring devices plus well, what is called now smart pumps may be the best combination, realizing, of course, that the equipment may be malfunctioning. But I, I highlight here one point. You can argue that, again, 6.5% is not high enough, but it's possible operator error. So that means associated with more serious adverse outcomes than any device related. So that means that we this is something that we have control over. In this particular case, um, the study by Metzner in current opinions and anesthesiology about uh, uh, five years ago, 
uh, looking at 26 remote location claims, if you take a look, again, you can see that most of these cases happen in the GI suites, so that means when you have endoscop endoscopic procedures, colonoscopies, uh, or upper GI endoscopy, or some, again, even procedures with, uh, uh, that deals with the uh, cholangian system and the pancreas. Um, the most common drug used in this particular case was uh, propofol. Substandard anesthetic care, to me, again, if you highlight these options, is again, again very scary. 86% substandard. Preventable by uh, better monitoring, about 62%, and capnography, 15%. Non monitoring at all, 15%. Death or brain damage linked to over sedation, 92%. And I don't think I have to read the last one. It's a very expensive proposition to have this. Uh, it, can, it can cost a lot of money. And then uh, once you go and review the case, you realize that something failed, something was missing in regards to monitoring of this particular, uh, particular patient who was previously healthy. So opioid induced respiratory depression. I think it, this is uh, very interesting because it kind of just reinforces the uh, definition that I presented before about uh, respiratory depression. So this is again 178 uh, post-surgical patients uh, that uh, happen to be managed on the PCA with morphine or neparidine or Demerol. And the patient got continuous oximetry and carbonography, and they noticed, of course, that 12% of them had hypoxemia, saturations less than 90%. And of course, you can have an, a sub-definition of the hypoxemia as severe hypoxemia. And 41% of them developed bradypnea. So even if you sustain the same depth of ventilation, at this point, you will still be hypoventilated once your respiratory rate goes down. The incidence, um, as you see here, 41% and 12% is much higher than the one that has been uh, reported in, the pre in previous years, that is 1% to 2%. So again, when you have 40%, uh, to me it's actually very alarming that that happens, and sometimes we haven't been able to just notice that. And again, the factor is the time. So what do we do? I think it is very clear that we have observed changes, dramatic changes in the way we monitor patients. Pulse oximetry is not longer the way it was with uh, you had the motion artifact and now you're able to determine even more by just a simple uh, finger probe. But I think it's very clear to understand that uh, pulse oximetry has a limitation. And uh, as the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation stated in June of 2011, just again, relying on intermittent spot checks of oxygenation, pulse oximetry, and ventilation, and speaks of nursing assessment only because, again, nurses are much more commonly present during these procedures than RTs, are not adequate. And just simply, again, just uh, hoping to get uh, uh, something going on for the post-op uh, period to determine respiratory depression in this patient is, is kind of just urgent. So uh, this particular study by Hendrich, uh, just published again probably about six years ago, uh, how do medical surgical nurses spend their time? This is a 36 hospital time, 7% on patient assessment and reading vital signs, 26% experienced apnea of at least 20 seconds, then went and identified by anesthesia providers. 3% observed documentation of hypoventilation with no apnea, but I think, again, just in line with the previous report that speaks of a 41%, 56% hypoventilation detected with carbonography and 24% apnea. So if you tell me that I'm going to have one out of four percent, uh, one, of, one out of four opportunities to become apneic during, during the procedure, I guess being a physician and respiratory therapist, I'm going to ask myself, well, do you have something to detect that? So if I go apneic, you're going to just intervene or you're going to be at least aware and see what kind of impact I have. So I have a couple of questions related to monitoring. So let me just, uh, again, turn to Emily to just uh, pose those questions, and we'll give you some time to answer this. And this is, how often do you believe continuous pulse oximetry is routinely monitored when the uh, PCA pumps are used? So when we're using narcotics IV, how often do you think is continuously monitored? Pulse oximetry. So we'll give you... Uh, just uh, again, a few seconds to select 5, 20, 40, or 60 percent. What do you think it is? And just to let you know, doctor, we are getting a lot of voters coming in here. This Ten. will be an interesting poll. Okay, I'm going to give it three more seconds. 
Alrighty, I'm going to go ahead now and close the poll and I'll share the results. Doctor, okay. what do you make of those? Very interesting. Let's go ahead and let me see. Okay, so 5%, 20%, 40%, and the majority 60%. Uh, awesome. Okay, let's see the next question, uh, please, Emily. Okay, hang on just one second. So the next question is exactly the same, but now in regards to CO2. Again, I know that this is bias. You're listening to something CO2, but again, I don't know where you are, where you are, who you are. So please be as honest as you can. How often do you believe continuous CO2? And it's actually a belief. CO2 is routinely monitored when PCA pumps are used. So about again, 40 some percent of you consider that O2 uh, was uh, was monitored. So what about CO2? 5, 20, 40, or 60 percent of the cases. And the votes are pouring in. Let's just give it a few more seconds here. It's a very fast process. Okay, and now I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share the results. And doctor, what do you make wow. of this? Wow, this is actually very good. Um, that, that's excellent. So let me, let me share, uh, Emily, if I can go back to the presentation. Uh, what again, just uh, some people have done research on this and have determined exactly how how this happens. So let me just again go and advance the slides. So this is a, a very nice survey that came in the Pinch Management Nursing in 2013, so again roughly about a year ago, uh, to determine nursing practice pa patterns on monitoring for opioid-induced respiratory depression. This is actually a great response, 147 responses over 90 institutions. And the results were uh, just very close, if you think about it, in terms of the uh, continuous pulse oximetry, well, actually intermittent. So you answer about 40-some percent that in most instances they would be using continuous pulse oximetry. Well, in fact, it's less than what you think. So continuous pulse oximetry was only used about 25% of the cases where IV pumps pushing narcotics uh, were used. The intermittent use, though, was in more than half, so 58%. Uh, in terms of the epidural analgesia, the intermittent SpO2 was very close, 58%, and the continuous pulse oximetry, 40%. So that means that what you were answering for is much more consistent with what happens in epidural analgesia. So again, you, think, you believe, as overall as a group, that about 40 some percent are monitored with continuous pulse oximetry, but it's not when they use narcotics. We're only for analgesia. But again, what I wanted to just again illustrate to you is the use of the entitled CO2. So those of you who answer 5% were close, but even again, in this particular study, which is probably the only one that I could find that really determines how often do we, we monitor this, only 1.5% of the IV PCA pump was associated with the use of entitled CO2, and just barely uh, over 2% when the epidural uh, therapy uh, was used. So I think it is it's quite obvious to answer this question. Why carbonography is, I think, what we have learned in the basic physiology is because we are dealing with two different processes. Ventilation and oxidation are completely different. So what we, again, we just try to just provide oxygen to the tissues, of course, at the same time, just both uh, metabolism and, meta and ventilation will try to clear the CO2 um, the best way we can. So these are processes that require a different type of monitoring. The entitled CO2, uh, just on one side, will be reflecting changes of ventilation, in this particular case to detect alveolar hypoventilation and apnea, well, the pulse oximetry will give us a better sense of what happens with oxygenation. However, every single value, uh, I can promise you that any data you will see that, of course, will lag behind changes that happen in hypoventilation and apnea. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you in one second. As uh, my friend Jonathan Wall from the uh, University of uh, Birmingham in Alabama just uh, posted in Respiratory Care 2007, is cases of respiratory depression were 28 times as likely to be detected if they were monitored by carbonography, as those who were not monitored. So that means, again, if you think about it, just the, the whole, the entire puzzle should be resolved by probably doing what you're doing with pulse oximetry, but adding something that takes care of the CO2 or ventilatory issues, other than just simply observing the patient. I try to do this with my, uh, with my students only because I think it is relevant. 
And I think it speaks very clearly of monitoring against CO2 and uh, pulse oximetry. If you hold your breath, you realize exactly what's going to happen. So if you look at the entitled CO2 waveform, it's very clearly illustrated that if you hold your breath or if you become apneic, there's a flat line. However, you realize that I invite you to do this also if you're, again, if you're educate, educating these students on pulse oximetry, there will be pulse oximetry. The plethysmograph will show the waveform and there's a good chance uh, that, again, if you have normal subjects, they, they will be sustained for about two minutes just before something just slightly decreases in terms of uh, oxygenation. So that means that if you have a patient who's become apneic for about two minutes, three minutes, sometimes you may not see what you're expecting to see on the pulse oximetry because, again, the other piece of the puzzle may not be present, which is the capnography. What about supplemental oxygen and why is this important to, to touch on? Many, in many instances, as again, oxygen is routinely applied to patients just again, just to prevent hypoxemia. So it is quite common that even if you have uh, no pulmonary disease, you're going to be placed on some level of oxygen. Sometimes again, low level, but still some oxygen. I think what I wanted to show uh, from this study by Becker and Casablanca, just uh, published again five years ago, is uh, what happens to respiratory monitoring and physiologically speaking, when you actually select, uh, again, obese adult and a 10 kilogram child, which is probably about a, a year old, and what happens to the normal adult. And what you see is, again, the time from apnea. So the more normal you are, the, the greatest tendency there's, there's going to be for you to take much longer to drop your saturation from the time you have apnea. So that means there may be minutes uh, just before you manifest this. And now what I wanted to show you is what happens when you administer even two liters per minute of oxygen. And you should be able to see again that the time that it takes for a hyperventilation to, hypoventilation to occur would actually just be longer. So again, you are in a sense masking the presence of uh, hypoventilation. That is, uh, that is why the ASA, the, again, the American Society of uh, Anesthesiologists, recommends heavily that unless you have a patient at risk for hypoxemia, you may as well just conduct uh, the procedure on room air and only implement or just supplement oxygen when it is absolutely necessary. So what about the role that capnography has plays in the incidence of respiratory depression? So let me just go over again just a few of them. This is again in the endoscopic setting where if you find, uh, let's say, capnography or CO2 monitoring, this is probably where you're going to find the bulk of the data that supports exactly what we need to be uh, using these days, the endoscopic or the GI uh, suite. John Commission recommends ventilation monitoring for, again, procedural sedation for GI endoscopy. This is a particular study on 247 patients where you had the study arm and the open arm. And this is, a, in a nutshell, uh, a team that is blinded to capnography, but the other team that was prompted uh, by capnographic changes. So at least somebody was informing, uh, by the way, I see something going on in capnography while the other part of the study was uh, just remain blinded. And the primary endpoint was just to determine the occurrence of hypoxemia. As you can clearly see, when you're blinded, the number of hypoxemic events is just uh, just tremendously high. As you can see in the p-value, uh, what you see listed one, under one, two, four, and five, uh, you can clearly see that uh, all of this data was significantly, statistically significant. So that means that you have much number of events uh, of hypoxemia and apnea, 63% compared to if you had, uh, again, entire CO2 monitoring. So I think it is it's quite clear that you can improve the monitoring of respiratory depression by uh, implementing capnography. Uh, this is a very nice randomized control trial by Lightdale that actually has been a, a relatively pioneer on the implementation of both capnography and the combination with smart pumps and has determined uh, the rate of uh, respiratory depression to be dramatically improved in uh, this uh, particular institution. In this particular case, 163 children, 174 elective GI procedures. Uh, they were using nasal cannula two liters per minute. And again, they were just blinded to the, uh, the piece of equipment, in this case, a microstream capnography. 
they, uh, they signal alveolar hyperventilation by determining if, if, again, if they had events that lasted more than 15 seconds, uh, while the other one was more than 60 seconds. The primary outcome, again, to determine if they had some events of hypoxemia. As you can clearly see from the data, from what I'm showing here, the endoscopy staff documented poor ventilation 3% of all procedures and no apnea, 56%. And again, as I mentioned before, 24% of apneic episodes, when again, when we rely on just simple observation and pulse oximetry, was only 3%. So I think it is clear from, based on this uh, study by Lightdale, that uh, early detection of desaturation due to alveolar hyperventilation uh, was, achieved, was achieved even uh, despite the use of routine oxygen procedures. But this uh, figure, again, without complicating too much your lives, uh, I think it's very clear to show that if you have uh, the capnography arm just results in a significant difference of uh, recogni recognition of oxygen desaturations uh, just overall, uh, versus actually not being able to determine uh, which monitoring device you use. For PCI, for PCA, in this particular study by Pollens, you can see 40% reduction in the reversal or the use of the PCA narcotics, but also something important, 100% reduction in transfer to higher level of care for respiratory suppression after implementing carbonogram for PCA. So I think it's very clear that you will probably get less patient in the ward or even the ICU after you use monitoring devices. Uh, in this particular case now for Weber, uh, published in respiratory care uh, about three years ago, is that after implementing uh, the post-op management with entitled CO2 monitoring, they just noticed a, a dramatic reduction of the use of naloxone or, or Narcan. So that means that they reported in this particular case in 2011 now more than 600 days without any serious respiratory event, which is again something that we, uh, we many times chase uh, in regards to outcomes, specifically speaking, let's say VAP, when we want to achieve or just be able to claim that we have no cases. So this is a, a very good example exactly what chemography, um, the result or the impact was in this. Respiratory therapy and implementation of chemography. So what we're trying to do, of course, is just to to determine the severity and the frequency of the adverse drug events that relate to any type of procedural sedation or the use of analgesia. In this particular case, um, I think it is, uh, is that uh, a percentage of those patients have just uh, resulted in, in progression to code blue. So that means detection of hyperventilation in this particular case may be critical. And if you transfer this data to, again, uh, pediatric, uh, pediatric uh, groups, it would be even more determined when we know, of course, that events of arrest happen for uh, respiratory reasons. So with this in mind, uh, let me just go ahead and just summarize and uh, try to come up with some recommendations, especially from the, uh, from the Joint Commission and the uh, Respiratory uh, the Society, uh, the Foundation. Uh, we, we recently published the guidelines. Uh, so Brian and I, uh, Brian, David and I just put this uh, together. Um, uh, and this relates only to, again, during mechanical ventilation. This is in 2011. I think it's very clear that we probably need a, uh, an update in regards to what happens to the non-intubated patient, uh, patients and how important it is to institute some CO2 monitoring. So um, this is from the uh, Patient uh, Safety Council, Council. And what you can see here clearly without going into details is that it, the more frequent events you, you're able to capture. So if you have, again, pain, sedation, rate, quality, pulse oximetry, but now it is clear that you see now uh, entitled CO2. So if you think about safety issues that relate to uh, being able to determine and manage uh, this uh, patients who are at risk, or even those who are not at risk, but again have a tremendous risk of developing respiratory depression, I think it's very clear that, clear that these columns do not stop at pulse oximetry and simply observation and qualification of pain, but also include the entitled CO2. So these are some of the recommendations that uh, just came out with based from the Anesthesia Facing Safety Foundation that was recently published. 
Continuous electronic monitoring of oxygenation and ventilation should be available and considered for all patients. You see, it is not only for those who have higher risk for respiratory depressions and would reduce the likelihood of and recognize clinically significant opioid-induced respiratory depression in the post-op period. Second recommendation that has been made is that capnography or other modalities, so again, this opens the door to companies that are trying to work uh, heavily on being able to just come up with devices that can attest to limitations that may exist from entitled CO2 transcutaneous or to CO2 monitoring and again trying to just come out with the best device but I think at this point it's very clear that what we have available and what we've had for quite some time is something that we ought to implement and use more often than we do uh, today. We cannot just simply rely on again simple observation. We try it, we have to match the best we can what we are trying to observe on the patient and just to objectively determine if data is supporting the fact that the patient looks okay or the patient is uh, getting um, is uh, deteriorating. The other one is create and implement policies and procedures for the ongoing clinical monitoring of patients receiving opioid therapy by performing serial assessments of the quality and adequacy of respiration and the depth of sedation. And I think it is again is very key that if you have 40% of the personnel who is non-anesthesiology related or specialized, I think the more we are called, especially again for this audience of respiratory therapists, just to be aware that the presence of the RT uh, has become more and more in this for the longest time in the bronchoscopy suites, but again more and more in uh, situations where procedural sedation is taking place. The other one uh, reads, in addition to monitoring respiration and sedation, SpO2 can be used to monitor oxygenation, but chemography should be used to monitor ventilation. And of course, again, I guess my bias just by just by knowing uh, one specific device that I have tested in the past uh, for COVID, and again, having all the information you want may be facilitating things, but again, who could argue if you have two separate pieces of the, uh, devices measuring exactly the two things, ventilation and oxygenation, you are actually serving the patient better. Uh, staff should be educated, uh, and I think I appreciate, again, the support that Covidian is giving to all of you and to for giving me the opportunity to share this with you is because I think without educating uh, educating us ourselves as, again, clinicians or educators themselves, uh, we, we are not going to be able to accomplish anything for patients. Uh, even from the standpoint of being in academics, I can only uh, teach what is going to be better for my students to, again, apply and to improve patient care. So I think this, again, is a role for every single company putting products out there, uh, so as in this particular case Covidian is doing, spending, again, just investing into educating all of us about, again, what is coming, what is, uh, uh, what is good for uh, patient safety. When pulse oximetry or capnography is used, it should be used continuously rather than, than intermittently. I see, I think that's very clear that from the percentages that you responded to, but it's quite obvious that we don't use monitoring as often. This should be standard of care, period. If we are to monitor ventilation and oxygenation, we ought to, con to monitor this continuously because otherwise it only takes, again, a couple of seconds or just a few seconds or a couple of minutes just before a patient turns apneic. And if we are not doing this continuously, I don't think we are serving the, our, our customers, again, our patients very well. At this point, uh, we, have, we have time for questions. Again, uh, I'm going to conclude with a statement is that, that uh, it doesn't matter where you are. If you are a manufacturer out there, if you are a clinician, uh, respiratory therapist, physician, uh, nurse, PA, uh, who at any point may be having a chance to take care of patients in the, in the procedural sedation or the post-op, just realize that sometimes we underestimate the, uh, the effect of many of these medications, either by just simply uh, claiming ignorance about it or just simply by just not realizing that this happens quite often. So I'm hoping that my message today is that uh, respiratory depression is here to stay it happens more often than we believe, that I think we, are, we haven't been doing the right thing in terms of monitoring, but we have the tools at this point, and it may be actually better tools out there that have been explored, uh, which again, I've been, I've been presenting to, but it's again beyond the, the scope of this presentation, to make sure that we complete the puzzle. So should it become the fifth vital sign? Should it be a space being shared by 
pulse oximetry and capnography? I would say yes. I shouldn't replace capnography pulse oximetry because it has a different role. So with this, I want to thank you. Again, we're going to take some questions, so I appreciate that. And let me just turn this back to Emily. Well, thank you, Dr. Restrepo. Wow, we have a number of questions here. And here's one from Evelyn, who says that it's protocol at her institution to have ETCO2 monitoring set up for all patients who have been administered narcotics. And she also mentions that the calibration of monitors is the bigger issue. What kind of comments would you have about that? Um, so if I understand correctly, um, if, you have, if you have, again, institutions where this standard of care, that's the way it should be. I guess one of the major limitations that exist is that if you know some of the limitations of the entitled CO2 monitoring, because then you may have some lagging behind, I, I, I can promise you, I can promise you this. Patients who are at risk or any type of procedure that you perform either in, in the ICU or outside the ICU setting that puts the patient at risk for alveolar hypoventilation, you're going to be better served by capnography, transcutaneous CO2 than only just doing pulse oximetry. Procuring devices is always in the mind of the administrators because, of course, if you don't have that, it's going to cost you money. It's, and I think, again, I'm not here to make any, any judgments on how you proceed about spending your money. I don't have any power on what to procure for my department, my particular department. Somebody else makes the decision, but I think it's very clear to invest, I guess, the same way that institutions are investing into power for high efficient aerosol devices where you realize that you may be paying about 600% higher than the typical jet nebulizer because now you want to invest in quality of care and so on. So I think it is, again, it's, it's, it's very difficult for me to just mention the pharmacoeconomics when I don't really know exactly sometimes how much uh, you have to invest to institute probably what you Evelyn, is doing or achieving in your institution, which should be the standard of care. Thank you, Doctor. And Evelyn did make a comment that the calibration of the monitors is the bigger issue. So I imagine... I, I, I completely understand. I agree with you. Again, uh, being a therapist for quite some time, I realize again that technology has progressed, but sometimes uh, they haven't gotten where we want to. And I think it is, a, it is a call for the manufacturers to just uh, fill in the gap and just make sure that if you want some, in, some technology being implemented, you have to make it easier on the end user and you have to, again, deal with limitations that have existed for quite some time. I can tell you, though, anyway, that if you look at uh, the way entitled CO2 monitoring was uh, for uh, previous patients, remember that we, we were not just to be touching pediatric patients because those adapters were so heavy and, of course, they listened to the clinicians and they made them lighter. So I think it is a fact that, again, you as clinician have, has to be just contacting every single rep and say, what are you going to do about this? because this is actually what is preventing the implementation of something that we find very useful. Why? Because now there are limitations uh, that need to be taken care of from the manufacturers and not the end users. Okay, and here's a question from Jennifer. What, any thoughts on the challenges of monitoring patients with VQ mismatch, such as COPD? That's a very good question, and I'm so glad you asked. Otherwise, I would have asked myself so I could answer that. Uh, yes, VQ mismatch. So you realize that, of course, when you have VQ mismatch or ventilation perfusion match, the entitled CO2 is going to tell you only part of the story because if you have a mismatch, of course, the entitled CO2 is not going to be a very good reflection of the actual PaCO2. My call is for this. Typically, when you, when you implement any type of monitoring, non-invasive monitoring, what you, have to, what you have to respond to is to correlate this with blood gas. So you realize that if, you, if the gradient is not 3 to 5 millimeters mercury the way it's supposed to, but now it is 10, keep in mind that the presence of the VQ mismatch that you clinically assess for and you determine should serve you to use the entitled CO2 properly to realize that next time you get a blood gas and you get a correlation and it's closer, is because ventilation perfusion has been resolved or has been decreased. 
So I don't. I wouldn't negate the possibility uh, possibility of using a patient only because you have a VQ mismatch. It's just to realize that the gradients will be greater. That you understand that's exactly the reality that you're going to be encountering. But then you use this as a training device. I prefer you to use that than not using anything at all and just just simply. I, I don't. I don't mean this. Uh, actually very well, exsanguinate the patient because you want to get blood gases every 30 minutes. So I think with the limitations of entitled CO2 monitoring, well, do you have transcutaneous? And if you do, does it serve well with the population that you're, that you're trying to uh, monitor CO2 on? I, I think it is up to you, but I think understanding the limitations of equipment will make you a better clinician too, because you realize that, again, VQ mismatch will impact the correlation of the entitled CO2. Thank you, Doctor. Pat has a question. He's asking, what is your opinion about capnography via nasal cannula type devices? Is it as accurate as ETCO2? I can only speak for, uh, and again, this will be, of course, my bias, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping that I get across very transparent. My experience with uh, non-invasive entitled CO2 mon monitoring has been great. Uh, we, we don't have it, uh, just uh, data yet on a multi-center study on something else, which is the integrated pulmonary index, but my experience uh, with intubated patients and extubated patients, after we extubated patients on the nasal cannula uh, the, uh, using the cabinet stream, and even for those who are just uh, mouth breathers, oral breathers with the oral flap, we were actually getting information that was very accurate. Without being able to compare to other devices, my experience with non-invasive monitoring of CO2 was very positive, and it was just correlated when I look at blood gases. Okay, and now Benjamin has a question. What are your thoughts regarding handheld CO2 monitors, such as the EMMA monitor by Massimo? Do you find them to be effective or of any value? Okay, so keep in mind that when you look at CO2 monitoring, you have to look and see exactly what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you have all the way from the colorimeter, so that means the, just, a, just the bold cross the detection of CO2 when you have uh, the standard of care uh, for, uh, for endotracheal tube placement. Same way that you have pulse oximetry. You have pulse oximetry and you have handheld uh, pulse oximeters that only provide you the, with the numerical data, so that's the meter, so capnometer, for example, for the pulse oximeter. Uh, I don't, again, I haven't played enough with the, the advice, but I, my message is always try to get with advice that gives you both capnometer and capnography, so that means that you see waveforms. Uh, many times, again, you probably realize by working with patients that in, when you look at the monitor and the pulse oximetry reads very low, but by the same token, everybody's just freaking out, but without looking at the signal, is very poor. That's mean, that means that the plethysmograph is not giving you a waveform that is consistent with that low pulse oximetry that you're reading. So my invitation is that I think, again, handheld devices are, are here to stay. The, the technology has evolved, so more accurate they have become. So I don't think I have a, any particular comment about every any specific device. My message would be is, try to get the one that provides you with the most rich information. The waveform, which is again beyond the spectrum of this presentation, the waveform can sometimes tell you much more information with a simple number. But if you only have the number, I would go for it. And just try to at least get a sense of exactly where the CO2 is. Realizing again, as Evelyn had just asked before, if you have the presence of VQ mismatch, you realize that the patient is not hypocapnic. It's just that the gradient is so high that at least you get a measurement of how much the gradient, or how far the gradient is. Thank you, Doctor. Mark would like to know, are the ETCO2 to SPO2 comparisons different for children than adults? We have providers who say that SPO2 monitoring is better for pediatrics. Wow, that's, uh, that's a very good question. I don't know if I have the right answer for this, um, but I'm going to tell you based on my experience as uh, being uh, also for about six years or so a pediatric ICU uh, therapist. We used uh, capnography heavily in the ICU. I have to say that I don't have a lot of experience with the non-invasive use of entitled CO2 monitoring on the non-intubated pediatric patients. 
So, but I, I would I, I have to say that based on my interpretation of the literature, uh, pulse oximetry, of course, is much more popular. But I don't think it is because pulse oximetry is superior to the entitled CO2 or the CO2 monitoring. I think it is just the fact of what I mentioned before in the webinar is the lack of familiarity of some of the limitations that you can use to continue monitoring CO2 and pediatric patients and to use this data adequately to monitor ventilation versus just simply oxygenation. Keep in mind that for both adult and pediatric patients, the, response, the, uh, the determination of hypoventilation if you use pulse oximetry will be always delayed, especially in the presence of oxygenation. So what I'm trying to say is that pulse oximetry again has evolved greatly and I think it, it continues to be the greatest tool we have at this point non-invasively to assess oxygenation. But I think it has major limitations at, at any age group in hoping that this is going to just simply resolve the fact or the, um, the question that we have about is this telling us the whole story behind hypoventilation? And it may well be, what I, part of the data that I presented today, is that when hypoventilation occurs, pulse oximetry will tell us the story probably way too late, even in pediatric patients. Thank you, Doctor. Daniel has a question. How effective are end tidal waveforms in diagnosing various respiratory complications? Very effective. That's my answer. No, I'm just okay. It is it is very effective? I, I think the uh, when we learn about entitled CO2 on capnography, I think there's a good explanation for having the shape of the capnograph the way it is supposed to be. Those alpha and data angles and the degree of inclination and the reason why you have a, just a vertical. Uh, uh, very cool uh, configuration of the waveform once you take a breath because then you don't you don't breathe CO2. It, it has again it has a every single phase of this slopes uh, have a clear physiological explanation. It's a mixture of the CO2 the CO2 through the airways until you get to the entitled CO2. So with that in mind, the configuration of the waveform will tell you exactly what's going on also with the patient when the patient changes breathing pattern and the patient has breath stack when the patient is retaining CO2 and then your baseline increases. I think it is quite clear that you can determine exactly what's going on with the patient. So the answer is again, there are many configurations of the waveform that can tell you a lot of story behind, again, patients with COPD. Trying to determine, even if you don't have volumetric CO2 measurement, just the presence of pulmonary embolism. So, I agree. So that's why I said the, the best of the of both worlds will be to have, of course, the medical data along with the capnography, uh, so you can determine exactly how well the configuration of the waveform is. Okay, great. And we have just a few more questions. Tara wants to know: Is acoustical monitoring as effective as capnography? Are there any studies that support acoustical monitoring? I don't have any experience with this, so the answer would be very simple. I am not very familiar with this. I, I know the acoustics has, have been just playing a major role over the last uh, five years, even on uh, trying to determine uh, not only uh, minute ventilation and also just trying to help out in, in, in regards to uh, integrity of the airways for mucus clearance and, and so on. I don't have a lot of experience with this, so I, can, I have to be honest with you. I don't, I don't know what a good answer for that is going to be. Well, that was a very fair answer, though. Thank you, Doctor. Janice wants to know, what role does capnography play in polysomnography? Uh, very important. Um, polysom in polysomnography, uh, you, you realize that you, have, you rely on just a bunch of data, of course. From the uh, electroencephalogram data, when you look at the waveforms, uh, then you turn into pulse oximetry. But again, pulse oximetry will tell you only one part, and it, will, it may allow you to titrate, of course, uh, your CPAP levels and so on, but also, of course, the uh, impedance, if you, have, if you have impedance to the, uh, to the study. But also, again, CO2 may play a role on determining exactly when hypoventilation happens. So, you know, you realize that sometimes, again, the presence of apnea will be much easier to detect with the use of cap capnography versus waiting until simply the pulse oximetry drops. Is it absolutely necessary? I, I can argue that probably not, that it will probably just help you confirm 
when flows decrease. That's why you have a flow sensor in the nose anyway. And if, flows, if the flow sensor says, I don't feel any flow from the patient, I mean, there's only one thing that you can think of is that is when you, the hypopnea or the apnea event is happening during the polysomnographic uh, study. So I think, again, it will add, it will add as an element. Uh, you, I think it will quantify also what type of price is the patient paying in terms of the CO2 for every single apneic or event. When you build the hypopnea ap apnea index, index or the pulse oximetry hypopneas you have, this is how many apneas you have, this is how many events of pulse oximetry. But by the way, also, this is again how high your CO2 just went up, or if it remains a, a, a very relatively stable uh, CO2. So I think it adds uh, something to the, to, the, uh, to the factor. And I think again, realizing that one of the risk factors that I mentioned before uh, coming from the ASA is OSA, I, I think it is quite obvious that if you have that uh, past medical history or past medical history being positive for OSA, I think you absolutely have to use some CO2 monitor. Thank you, doctor. I have two more questions. Mark wants to know, do you think cerebral oximetry would help decrease the lag time during AH? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. I think uh, the technology is moving in that direction. Um, Everything, everything that is able to capture the effect of on oxygenation of hypoventilation will be actually better than the pulse oximetry that we have. So if you call it MERS, uh, the, the the new technology, uh, of course it will improve. Again, my my theory, and I'm hoping that again I, I get across as not being biased to, towards a product. It's just about the. The fact that we are dealing with something completely different. Ventilation is about CO2. So I believe that being able to capture uh, oximetry or just oxygen changes as a result of hypoventilation will come with devices such as that. Uh, my question is, that I, I probably haven't seen enough data about this, is that my belief is that they will still lag behind the true changes in CO2 and it may be, again, there's a, a lot of delay that may uh, prevent uh, patients from getting intervention promptly only because you're relying on an oxygen signal. I agree with you, again, the statement is right. The more we get into that technology, I think the sooner we can determine or detect oxygenation changes due to alveolar hyperventilation, but I don't think is the answer. And doctor, let me just ask you real quick. Margo wants to know, how do you tell the difference between upper or lower airway obstruction on the waveform, i.e. nasal or sinus obstruction? And this is our last question. On the waveform, there is not really uh, just a, a major uh, difference on the waveform. Uh, typically, again, it's going to just be uh, changing the, uh, the, tr uh, the trapezius kind of shape or square wave uh, pattern into kind of just a thin uh, where the alpha angle disappears. I don't think the, the key is going to rely so much on the waveform, but now clinically speaking, if you see a sign of obstruction on the waveform, now it is, I think, up to you to determine what is the source of the, uh, of the airway obstruction. Uh, it may be, again, and I agree with you, it may not be that clear if the patient doesn't have strider, but I think the clinical information will prompt you to believe if it is a lower, um, if, it, if it is a lower airway obstruction, in this particular case, if you have a patient with an exacerbation of COPD, if you have an asthmatic, versus the one that has, let's say, a piglotitis, laryngotracheal bronchitis, and so on. So I think clinically, you will be supporting probably the same typical waveform that you will have in airway obstruction theory, regardless of the source. Thank you, doctor. We have reached the end of our time together. I want to thank you very much for your time. The material that you've covered with us today is vitally important. Finally, last but not least, I would like to thank each and every one of you, our guests in the audience today, for your time and thoughtful attention. Thank you and take care, everyone. Bye for now. Thank you very much.